Hello everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, we are live, right? Hey, so, 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 something happened with it. We are live. I can see myself live here. Oh, okay, okay. Fine, fine. So, hello everyone. Hi. Uh, this is Meghna. We are live and I have with me Nidhi Suresh. Hi, Nidhi. That's Hi, it. Nidhi. Hi. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Nidhi? Uh, good, I think. Good. Not too bad. So, uh, first, uh, introduce yourself uh, for those who don't know. So, I am a reporter with News Laundry. Uh, in fact, I think I can I can safely say that I've only been a reporter with News Laundry largely. Uh, it's been where I started off my career. Uh, I'm 26 now, as we discovered today <laughs> before we started this live. And I started working when I was around 22. Um, so, right after college, I went to Kashmir, which is where I started my first uh, reporting job. Uh, I worked with a local newspaper and then I shifted to News Laundry a few months after and have been working with News Laundry uh, since then, except uh, for in between when I took a break to do my master's uh, and got back. And now I'm with uh, News Laundry in Delhi. Not Again, the Faida Kya Hua. I mean, like, you went you know? from. Yeah. I know, I know. And, and like, it, that's the thing. Like I, I came back to discover that uh, in India, it, it, you know, you have to one, the market is so bad. Yeah. And then two, you have to choose between organizations where you, you know, how much you're willing to sell your soul um, in many ways. And, and that I don't think you will ever find an organization where you're just like this. I, I will do everything here without any complaints. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I found my way back to news only because I felt like this is where I had the most uh, space to do what I believed in. And uh, so, yeah, here I am and here we are. See, so like you did News Laundry, then you did a yeah. master's. Yeah. Because hoping that life will get better. And then you came back to News Laundry. So, think about it. Yeah. Think about no, your but, life choices. <laughs> but actually, in many ways, like, my, I didn't do a master's in where, like, I think a lot of people do Ivy League master's to sort of get a certain get part to become part of certain network mine was not an ivy league uh, university i didn't do a journalism course mm. i did mine in conflict and human rights so it was also to sort of because i didn't come with a news background and i didn't come right. with understanding uh politics or from a family where we had a lot of political conversations um so i i thought that my time during my master's was a very good time for me to sit back and think about my experiences even as a one-year-old journalist uh, and then come back with a different, deeper understanding of reporting, which it definitely did do. Like, I, I, that way, I feel like I had that space to at least think. Now you've been with News Laundry for a year, I think, right? Almost a year. It'll be a year on August 18th. Oh, amazing. So what is this, what is the one story that you did uh, in the last year, which you remember? I, I mean, without a doubt, I think the Hathras series is um, something that... Uh, I felt extremely strongly about and uh, I felt this need to follow up. So a lot of times I realized that, uh, you know, newsrooms, you have to figure out a beat for yourself, right? Mm. To figure out what is it you want to do, what's your speciality, what is what excites you the most. And I realized that we should probably have like a follow-up beat, like someone who doesn't... A beat story. called follow-up. A beat called follow-up where you just follow up. So other people break stories and you just do the following up. And, it's and you have been following the Hathras case till now, yeah. right? Yeah, so that's what's been exciting uh, and interesting for me and, and a real learning experience as a journalist of while we, uh, you know, report on an extraordinary violence that happened, there's all these quiet, deep-rooted silence. Like, mm -hmm. we don't want to talk about deep-seated sadness, right? We want to talk about shocking experiences. Right. Uh, because we're also, like, as an audience, as journalists, we're desensitized to a point where you know, some things don't just don't amaze us anymore yeah. Um, yeah. and so I think that to hold on to that sense of outrage is the biggest uh, task and that's what I've tried to do with Hathras so, that's uh, the story that's uh, stood out no, that's true and I'll come back to Hathras actually but I have to address chat as well okay. uh, hello chat 
Hello. Oh, I should also be looking at the chat, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, Lippy has sent you a link. You can just open it and you can see the chat okay. as well. So, uh, some uh, Muhammad is asking, Muhammad Habibuddin Shoaib is asking, uh, who is being interviewed? <laughs> who is? Who is being interviewed in this whole thing? So, it's like, uh, I, I guess we're having a conversation. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. And, so, guys, nobody's being interviewed. The point of this session is that uh, we wanted to uh, you to spend some time with Nidhi. Yeah, that's basically it. Like, you know, um, Nidhi has been working really hard with News Laundry for the last one year. And we thought it was a good idea to get her here. So you can ask her questions about, you know, her stories and also about this journalism, her experiences from the ground, what she does, how she does it, all of that stuff. And uh, it's just a casual conversation with you uh, more than me. So, of course, please leave your <laughs> questions. Please talk to Nidhi by all means. And Nidhi has maybe figured out how to open the chat now. Yes, I'm looking at the chat box on the YouTube channel. Is that yes, it? that's yeah. the one we are looking at. Uh, so, hello chat again. Hello. Nidhi also is now looking at you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Nidhi, so with heart. Somebody has asked who is Nidhi. Uh, yeah, Nidhi. Nidhi already introduced herself. Dude, you're on YouTube. You can just go back, see her introduction and then come back to us right now. So, I mean, you can yes. time jump. It's quite magical. Um, so, uh, Nidhi, so uh, with uh, Hathras, actually, I wanted to ask you, um, so what was the, what is the latest happening uh, there and uh, what happened in the latest follow-up? What did you find out? Yeah, so, I mean, when the second wave, uh, so let me just give context that after, yes. the, after the whole uh, violence that we saw with what happened to, uh, so I will refer to her as Asha because yes. we can't use a sexually assaulted victim's name or a rape victim's name. Uh, so after Asha's death, uh, the family in the name of protection is now being completely looked after by the CRPF. So there are at a time almost 20 CRPF men camped right outside their house. Also because the accused family lives right opposite, right? So it's almost like this, the village has been turned into a CRPF camp and it's even okay. now. Even now. Okay. And there was a, the first time in March, on March 5th, Asha's brother was to make a statement, was to give mm. his version of what happened in the district court, right? Um, and they were completely intimidated. People barged into the court. The other advocates uh, barged into the court. And the hearing had to be adjourned and postponed. And the um, lawyer, Seema Kushwaha, the family's lawyer, had to be escorted out of Hathras because of how bad the situation got there. So they didn't even allow the basic dignity of, for the brother to tell his story. Um, and the brother also told me that, I mean, it's, it's, it's multiple kinds of sadness, right? Like yeah. the brother, every time he walks into court, he makes sure not to look at the rapist in the eye. So he walks in uh, 15 minutes before, so he doesn't have to look at them. And he said, and they still haven't conducted her last rites. So they have a pot of ashes, which are sitting in the wardrobe next to her clothes, her, the nail polish that she loved, uh, and every time I leave the house, her father will not fail to ask me, how long did the Nirbhaya case take to get over? Because only once that's over, can this, once this case is over, can my family and I sleep? You know, it's a family that hasn't had a good night's sleep in days. Um, so at the moment, like, because of the second wave of the COVID pandemic, uh, all kinds of court hearings were stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not listed in the virtual hearings. Uh, and now they have, they, 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 it has been listed. The case is happening at two levels, right? One's at the Allahabad High Court, which is yeah. the case of post criminal, the Lucknow bench at Allahabad mm -hmm. High Court. And then there's the district level court, which is looking at the case of the gang rape and murder itself. Right. Uh, so that's that's sort of where it is. It's been in limbo. And this this was apparently the promised fast track case by um, Yogi Adityanath, who hasn't mm -hmm. even bothered to visit them, which is something that they're yeah. also set by. Um, um, he and, hasn't still visited them. No, he yeah. hasn't. And it's and something very interesting that her cousin brother told me was that this whole episode has really made the family think about where, like they said, you know, this, this government talks so much about being a Hindu and how important it is. But it's made us wonder whether we Dalits even count as the Hindus. Because mm -hmm. why has the chief minister not even visited us or given us that dignity of, a, of paying a visit? 
but that's the thing about also like you mentioned follow ups uh, yeah. with journalism it's yeah. actually very important also to follow up because then you keep uncovering different layers in the incident right yeah. like yeah, there is a caste angle there is a sanitation angle there is a, a, a gender angle absolutely uh, and plus then courts like how how do the courts function in this particular case It's yeah, very we important. have to understand that this is the Dalit family that dared to demand justice. For me, the story also starts from there in many right. ways. Right. Because so, why do we not have so many rape cases that are even getting reported, especially mm. uh, from the lower caste? Right. So there's a whole story there, and I and and definitely it's been the case that that I that has had my attention uh, through this time. Uh, I'm just going to uh, check the chat again. uh let's see what is happening um nidhi is our own nidhi did you ever visit uh, telangana slash hyderabad no i haven't maybe you haven't been. been to hyderabad i mean i've been as a child but not for reporting but you were in bangalore no i yeah but i i didn't uh, go to report <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, like i don't know why that question came but yeah okay yeah. <laughs> uh, uh how can new graduates join the team at news laundry uh, you can look at our careers page uh, on the website so whenever we have an opening we put it there also follow our social media handles we always put out like new openings there so you can do that um also if you want to intern you can write to us on contact at newslaundry.com um just write a uh, cover letter and a cv and you know why you want to intern with news laundry and that's it um nidhi has a presence of mind while answering to the questions thank you <laughs> Um, that's the basic necessity to be yeah. a um how was your journalism journey nidhi that's an interesting question um well i think i'm still on it so it's that that's to start with but uh, i mean you know i started my career in kashmir which 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 was a huge step for me right i went from being the south bangalore girl uh, who studied in a really good college and then i uprooted my life to kashmir uh, so for me it wasn't at 21 22 it wasn't just about learning to do a new job it was about learning to live in a new city it was about learning you know how to move houses and all of that so it was an extremely immer- for me journalism began as an extremely immersive experience because i was living in a place that i was reporting on so it was constant conversations about understanding a conflict that was you know happening for the last 70 72 years uh, but i would not trade it for anything else because the kind of growth as a person that it gave me right in terms of learning to listen to to listen to a conflict that almost plays out in vernacular and then having the responsibility of trans, uh, translating it to english and and mm-hmm. how much you can how deep you can go into people's stories and how how much people really want to talk you know and and but through the whole time i think uh, i started off really thinking i wanted to be a conflict correspondent you know like i wanted to be reporting geopolitical conflicts and i had this idea in mind about what kind of a reporter i would be and mm-hmm. and here and then when i came in delhi and i started i realized that um, there were so many other conflicts that i wanted to talk about especially now with gender yeah i yeah. do think that uh, uh, that is sorry like, interrupting uh, i think you have the youtube thing on no just mute it because there will be like a double mute up. only oh because i can reverb aa raha tha okay anyway go on go on sorry sorry oh, my youtube is on mute huh. yeah, yeah go on yeah so i feel like the the one question through this whole time that i've sort of keep going back to is uh why why we doing what we doing right mm. who we doing it for yeah um ultimately it's a job it's not that i'm i mean you know if i if i didn't get paid i wouldn't wake up to do what i did right because it doesn't yeah. yeah yeah um so it's it's not it's not it's not that but it's also um so like i and i've i've read a lot about this and i i feel like there's one author svetlana alexievich and i said this before that she's really the person who you know through her writing guided me we have as journalists i think we have the opportunity to 
write the first draft of history in yeah. some way right you get to witness it and you get to write it and to document that without constantly thinking like i don't subscribe to this idea that you do journalism for causing change i think it's a great by product of journalism of your work but it can't be the reason you wake up because mm-hmm. you can't make a change with every story right but you still have to do a story yeah like so, that's the hardest yeah. thing again right yeah to- i mean my reports i have are not going to do anything at the moment but mm. hopefully i mean if it does then then i that's a great by product but i'm mm. not going to do those stories to imagining that tomorrow things will There'll be some right? effect or something yeah Yeah. but uh, you know it's very interesting when you say that you know first draft of history like everybody has been saying this line recently as well mm. um i i just wanted to uh, ask you about how you approach a story essentially like when you say let's say you know you're covering uh, tejasvi surya right so right. which you did um yeah. so uh, like how did you approach say the case that you covered in bangalore it's the same thing i i didn't break the story i followed up mm. the story and found that there were still things to break about it right uh, because yes again he went to a war room he read out the names of 17 muslim men 16 actually and then the 17th person was found to be a muslim and asked to leave um and then they didn't find any uh, evidence against these men and they were then told that these men were reinstated we were told the men were reinstated but then so all i did was i just went back and and with the help of two lovely interns we sat and we called all the 200 people who were in the war room managed to get through a few then some agreed to talk in something and found out that the men are actually still uh, waiting for their job mm. uh, and and it's not just a wait for the job right it was a wait for dignity it was yeah, a wait yeah, yeah. for feeling safe again because uh, they were targeted all of a sudden so how do i approach a story it would just be uh, I think the, this idea of going back and listening and really mm-hmm. just asking so what's happened after that what happened after this what happened after that it's really just like this exercise in learning to listen and uh, one thing that i have realized that a lot of stories come up, come across when you don't when you're not always talking just about the topic mm-hmm. and you don't see the person you're talking to as a sum of those incidents Right? like if so if i'm going to uh, a person who have who was removed from the war room it isn't just about being removed from the war room you also ask them about their family their mm. loved ones and then you realize that there's a whole story that ties up to all these things and it's the same with hatras mm. right so mm. then once i was sitting with the family and they said that oh you know i have recently through youtube tutorials learned to give the entire family a haircut and i was like why 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 are you giving so this was her brother and i said mm-hmm. what, why why did you need to learn it and he said because you know if we have to go to the barber shop we are if two of us go there'll be four crpf men and we can only go in the crpf vehicles so i decided mm-hmm. to learn a new skill and so that's the story right and yeah, i was like, was that so you wouldn't get that story if you're just constantly talking about the incident it's also i mean it's a great anecdote i mean like do you have to also like see like i i was thinking like he learned it on youtube because pandemic right that's the immediate yeah. thing that came in my head but you know then when you say it it's like yeah oh yeah that's true it's yeah so crazy. to really not uh, and i approach it with a deep sense of also gratitude because as a journalist you're going into somebody's house with a certain amount of audacity right you're going yeah. and saying tell me about this worst thing that's happened in your life and you expect people to just pour out their hearts about something they're so vulnerable about uh so to go with the idea that this is not just a subject but a full human being mm. then i feel like i get the story and i and, and i can do justice or some amount of justice to that story that makes sense uh i should answer this is shorter no no it's fine it's fine i mean uh, please please go ahead uh yeah. and keep it long <laughs> uh no but uh, like there are some very interesting questions also coming in so gorav madan is asking how was your uh, experience interviewing e shridharan were you as disappointed learning of his views as he were so honestly um i knew of e shridharan from before as the metro man and all of that i yeah. hadn't yet formed i didn't have a fully formed opinion of him when i went in um so i went in and it i uh, just funnily i also think that he was very hungry 
when we had the interview right he just come back from campaigning and he was about to eat lunch and then he saw us and he said let's do the interview and he was kind enough to say that let's do the interview and then i'll have lunch uh, so i also know that he was very exhausted and hungry but that said um, my experience of it was it was a moment for me as a journalist because i think was i younger i would have gotten more uh, frazzled and, and frazzled right mm-hmm. but at that point there was this clarity that no like even if you are senior enough and telling me that i shouldn't be asking these questions now i am at a point where i have this understanding that this is my job and i'm not doing something wrong so yeah. i felt yeah. that that was a moment for me so it was also like a real moment where i learned to hold myself together i i, I remember having a conversation with you after that whole thing happened i think you had called me as well and yeah. aditya was there and uh, i remember you asking me what what do we do now essentially yeah. like because i think you were also like a little taken aback by the whole yeah, yeah. walking away thing and i so obviously yeah. it's natural uh, because i don't think we asked him something he hadn't already been asked yeah he had already been asked these questions i remember i had watched dhamia's interview with him uh, from the news minute before i went in and she'd also touched upon the idea of these the idea of love jihad and he'd had a very patient conversation so i i just wanted him to go deeper into those things mm-hmm. uh but he didn't like he didn't even want to have that conversation so i was quite taken aback and i didn't he think i asked him really shocking so is this hungry maybe, maybe. old man <laughs> like like <laughs> maybe he was hungry no yeah. but uh, it was very interesting like when uh, you know that, that's the thing like i i think after that thing came out a lot of people were also asking would you put that out essentially right you know what does that really add except for sensationalizing it maybe right did you think about this as well no because it was important to put it out it was mm-hmm. important to tell and show that there, here was someone who is going to be a leader but wasn't willing to answer questions wasn't didn't have the patience to sit through and take tough questions mm-hmm. like i'm not there to ask him questions that he wants to talk about right uh i'm there to ask him questions about what like, and these were questions people were asking yeah. on ground uh so i thought the fact that he walked away in itself was a statement and it was important to it was important to put it out yeah i i mean i agree absolutely i mean uh, it was very uh, strange but well done on that i feel like uh wait uh, so there is a uh, dear nidhi good to know this is swati vaidya i should read out the names it's very mm-hmm. bad habit uh dear nidhi good to know you feel it is more important to follow up the story uh, which has once been a breaking news will you please explain the rationale you must have in your mind about follow up journalism uh i mean it's like we spoke about like i think that once uh, there's been say there's breaking news right uh, you can't fall, like the news can't get broken after that like yeah. you have to keep following up because that's not where a story ends and we have instances where journalism has proved that like even with if you take nirbhaya because of relentless journalism because of relentless protest because of relentless outrage uh i think a lot of our job in journalism is also not to increase the rage right mm-hmm. but it's to sustain outrage and that is the reason why i think that it's so important to uh, do follow ups and remember this happened and remember why this continues to happen that's a very notable <laughs> quote i must say our job is not to uh, like add the rage, rage but our job is to sustain the outrage, outrage. nidhi you should uh, <laughs> write it down and i should like but uh, i should put, put it on my uh, put it on a post it okay like <laughs> <laughs> sign it uh so uh, wait uh, there are there are a lot of comments uh, guys please uh, keep uh, chatting with us i'm reading some stuff as well uh, mohammed al shameli thank you for the super chat guys uh, we appreciate the super chat but we would appreciate it more if you go to newslaundry.com and subscribe uh, because when the public pays the public is served and nidhi gets her salary so please yes. chehra dekho <laughs> and you get our ground reports which come from <laughs> Which yeah means- i mean of course like uh, didi i wanted to ask you about that as well uh, you know uh, i think a lot of people don't realize the expenses that you have to uh, sort of 
expend on like a yeah. story right up to for instance like the latest one that you did when you went to karnataka and you covered the tejasvi surya incident uh, how much did it cost like what what were the major expenses if you could just tell people yeah i mean more than karnataka because karnataka also is where like i have people and i knew where like i could stay with them yeah. uh, but i like for example kerala right like mm-hmm. like one room per night and it was both aditya and i so we'd have two rooms uh we'd spend easily somewhere between 800 to 1500 on a room mm-hmm. uh so that's like 30 days yeah. right? so yeah. if you if i'm say spending average of 1000 per night it's 30000 just for for me for 30 days yeah uh, and then 60000 if we're two rooms right? yeah. so that itself is a lot and then you have uh food expense traveling expense you there's always something or the other comes up you maybe you might lose a gadget and then you have to replace that um and of course you you can't plan reporting in a way where you know two months in advance and make the best kind of booking mm. right things change on ground and you have to take a chance and you also we also have to then account for uh stringers Mm-hmm. right because you're always going on ground where you don't really know the place or might not really know the that's true <laughs> like freelancers essentially yeah freelancers and you have to pay them because they're actually doing such a great service to you mm-hmm. um and adding to your report so then you also pay them so uh, i mean easily uh, <laughs> it's it's a huge expense mm-hmm. and which is interesting also i think as a journalist for me when i work with news laundry uh it's not just that i'm doing my job right we're doing our subscription appeals which uh, can sometimes be a lot like everywhere we go we're asking people to help us mm-hmm. and and have our backs but for me it's it's very interesting as a journalist that i understand the business model of news only and i and and it then you feel really part of the organization and you yeah. know yeah. that this person who's who's subscribing to news only is directly contributing to you and your work and how much you can do so it's true like even in bengal so we have this very uh, the great subscriber uh, barnik uh, so he is yeah. the one who helped us a lot in bengal actually so he yeah. lent us his car right so he's like why are you hiring a taxi if you can drive just take my car so we yeah. took his car and we yeah. were driving around for i think we did a 12 day trip mm. um we left that's the thing we used to leave at like some 6:30 in the morning and come back at like 12 in the night and like all day i was just driving and reporting and yeah. uh, parikshit was translating and shooting and manisha yeah. was reporting and also like doing her videos etc um yeah. you know it's it's very nice because when we met him it's so nice to actually see that you know he believes in us right i mean like he he yeah. genuinely he believes in me enough to give me a car so I mean, like that's a big responsibility but uh, i think uh, it also adds to the sense of accountability yeah so you, absolutely yeah you really feel indebted to your subscriber you, you, you feel like, accountable like you know like you feel completely you, accountable there is yeah. this gentleman who is lending his car like we, we, we better do a good job i mean like yeah. that yeah. that's the thing I know. additional <laughs> pressure for some weird reason <laughs> yeah Yeah. Uh, I I'll just take more questions. Um, let's see some of the latest one. Wait, journalist measuring contest? No, guys, no. Please, we are colleagues. We are friends. We don't measuring contest. Oh, <laughs> contest. Uh, any interesting story slash anecdote from Kashmir? From Kashmir. Yeah. Mm. yeah. as a jo- i had a very heartwarming uh, experience yesterday actually um so there was uh, there's a woman called mali aunty uh, she used to stay so there is downtown kashmir which used to be one of the most volatile areas uh, i mean I, i i say used to because i haven't been there now for a year um it was one of the most volatile area, volatile areas and after prayers every friday in, at jamia masjid there used to most likely be protests Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's always a clash uh, between the forces and the protesters. Um, and during one of the and and Mali Aunty lives next to Jamia Masjid. She used to be someone who uh, during my time there really opened her heart and opened her house to me. So ever, either if there was a protest and I'd have to find a safe place, I would go to her house and sit. If the protest got uh, uh, violent, mm-hmm. or always it used to just be me, me visiting her before the protest also and. protest sites there are also like that's where you know you meet all the journalists and you're talking to everyone and i used to meet mali aunty as well so 
and actually i hadn't met her for 5 years and yesterday a friend of mine and i don't have a contact or anything had gone back and video called me from her house and uh, we spoke over video call so that's like the immediate anecdote that came to my <laughs> oh, mind oh that's really sweet yeah she was she was also hard of hearing so and because you know she stays near she like it was everything was always very uncertain mm. and i was there at a time where also like kashmir was exhausted it was after the burhan wani Um, incident. Um, it was in 2016. Yeah, Burhan Wani was July 2016, 2016, and so I was there a few months after. Um, but there's so many stories from Kashmir. I feel like the reporting on the Tabasum Guru story, which is the one I got trolled quite a lot on. Uh, this is Abdul Guru's wife, and mm-hmm. to tell her story uh, and see that you know she uh, sat me down and trusted. me with a story that was so in depth and so personal um so all those little anecdotes were were very special to me um there is a, a few things uh, so meghna when are you getting a pandemic haircut what are you talking about i look fabulous <laughs> uh, like <laughs> meghna your explanation series just super uh, i think news laundry failed to use social media like facebook instagram efficiently what's your opinion on it uh i don't like facebook i mean i personally don't like facebook i mean i'm not talking about news laundry uh i think um, they've been uh, demo- they- they've not been showing news lately a lot uh, they've been pushing more friends and family updates and uh, i think instagram is obviously a very visual medium so i'm not super convinced that it's for news of course like there we are on instagram and we do uh, put up our stories etc uh but i that's my opinion uh but as far as we know we have been growing a lot on instagram and facebook uh page wise even on youtube we just hit a million um etc so uh, i think we're doing okay won't you say yeah, maybe, no yeah uh, do, do you also post your stories on instagram i do and it's been such a dilemma cuz i'm constantly thinking about my social media game you know cuz <laughs> I think like there is so much pressure to like be there, promote yourself, because like it seems like your career depends on Twitter in so many ways, you know. It does, though. I mean, it does, like, it does I, now, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. and I'm I'm just like so tired of waking up and thinking about my social media game because I don't have any, <laughs> and I'm fairly boring on social media. I think that uh, I just post my stories on Twitter and I do a thread. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I should be retweeting and. saying more things but i'm also also the other thing is i'm very um uh, scared of putting my opinion out there because i feel like i'm still young and i'm still growing and i might change my opinion tomorrow i don't know if i know and know a topic enough to talk about it sometimes although i might have an opinion so it's it's a battle i think a lot of young journalists and i discuss this with my contemporaries it's it's a struggle but sometimes you do it's just feel like though. um like it because you're a digital journalist uh, you yeah. have to think about all these things now it didn't it wasn't yeah. there earlier and now yeah it's like your career depend but it's not like so for instance like i'm just saying you do your stories of course you will share them like because you also want people to read it right yeah, um because you've worked on it and you did it yeah. uh, the organization also wants people to read that story etc but also it's also a future thing right so because if you have a big social media presence then if you apply for a job elsewhere maybe you'll get a better yeah. opportunity that's also a thing i mean it's yeah yeah see it's... now i'm thinking about it and i'm a little stressed <laughs> oh shit i added <laughs> sorry sorry baby sorry sorry guys sorry that was not the intention <laughs> no no but i think we've also had this conversation in office quite a bit uh but i think that uh, like with manisha i've spoken about it quite a bit about uh, because it's also time consuming right yeah and then when is the time today to think or to read or, and i sometimes get scared because i can't finish a newspaper and i'm thinking my god i'm a journalist if i can't read a newspaper and a sitting um it's difficult yeah and i also i'm not that journalist who has an opinion on everything some things i i don't have any thoughts on but you know you get a physical newspaper still 
I do. I do. Oh, that's nice. I yeah. I stopped getting mine because the thing is that I used to get one uh, Indian Express, but then yeah. I realized that I read the news on the day now, so the next day I just end up reading the same thing, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. Kind of I mean, pointless. for me, I feel like as a young uh, uh, reporter, it's the discipline that I'm just trying yeah. to yeah. Yeah, important. Yeah. Like in, in school, they used to tell us, no, that you know, or oh, rose paper, but half karo, you yeah, know, yeah, read yeah. the paper. Every I wish day. I did more than. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't either. No, I don't think anybody did. I was like, yeah. worldly affairs. What worldly affairs? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> coming to farmers' protest, uh, how did you break the language barrier? As most of them speak Punjabi. Yeah, my journalism career has been about breaking language barriers because <laughs> I don't, uh, I didn't speak Hindi. I learned to speak Hindi because I used to dance on Bollywood songs, and my mom used to explain the meaning. So I would explain, I would emote better. Um, so that's why I learned Hindi. I didn't know Kashmiri. I didn't know. So I think language barrier. I have realized that if you can connect with people, and uh, you know somebody out there will understand what you're trying to say. Hmm. And even if uh, so, a lot at the farmers' protest, many of the older farmers uh, didn't speak Hindi at all. But there were yeah. also you've you been there, and, and uh, there were a lot of young, educated uh, farmers, and it wasn't like <laughs> like they really broke that stereotype of farmers. Hmm. Right? So a lot of the time, they were able to communicate in the language that I could understand, rather than me making an effort. Uh, so whenever and most of the time, I have language barrier issues. I generally have an off-camera conversation, um, and and even then, sometimes it's been an issue. Like I know that in Karnataka, when I went to report and I speak broken Kannada, I did an immediate live translation of something this woman had said in Kannada, and I'd gotten something wrong. Um, so that's the danger of it, right? Like because I didn't like we had to put out the video quickly, and I didn't want to subtitle it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the farmers' protest, I it was it, it's been a very smooth experience for me because there's always somebody around to help me understand either a young farmer who speaks Hindi and Punjabi and can help That's me. true. And so we I, had gone together. You had taken me as yeah, a guide as yeah. well. I didn't see any, I didn't face any particular language problem. No, I mean, I'm comparing it with West Bengal, for instance, like where everyone yeah. is like speaking Bangla and I couldn't. Um, yeah, I think farmers protest was fairly okay and also you do understand a little bit of Punjabi when they speak it it's like I don't yeah, know why yes, instinctively I understand Punjabi now yeah I don't I have that instinct yet but uh, <laughs> I think it'll it'll happen longer I stay in the yeah. Delhi yeah of course <laughs> uh, there is a one interesting question from Tingne Heart Cookie sorry if I mispronounced your name uh says that what makes you stay with news laundry interesting actually um what makes me stay with news laundry i think uh news laundry has given me a lot of space uh right i know uh, other journalists who have editors or who have deadlines and i've briefly worked with other organizations where there is this uh, expectation to produce these many stories a day these many things to do these many things a day and I think news laundry has reasonable expectations. Like there's a certain understanding, like Raman sir has an understanding of what kind of journalists we are. I work with him now for two, three years. Um, I have phases and it's it's also something I'm working on because I go through phases. Like sometimes I'm, I do a lot of reports. Like right now I feel like I'm in a bit of limbo and, and should be pushing myself more uh, to produce more things. But I work, I think News Laundry has been amazing for me that way. It's given me the space and also let me choose the stories that I want hmm. to do. They're always asked, what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to work on? We have our edit meeting where we bring our ideas, and we you know, discuss it and we have that opportunity to convince our seniors that this is what we think is important. Um, and then of course there's some back and forth and we decide if it's feasible or not. But yeah. a lot of the times that, that opportunity itself is not there for a lot of young reporters. That's true. It, it like uh, I mean, from what I've heard from other edit edit rooms, the editor is the one who's directing you ki yeah. ja ke story karna hai. But uh, yeah. news laundry may so to give an idea to the people who are watching, every Tuesday we do like an edit meeting uh, where okay. all employees of news laundry are there. Uh, all reporters are there, editors, producers, everyone, um, and we essentially 
anybody can pitch an idea for a story slash news report slash show slash anything video and uh, the editors then discuss it with them and then we decide whether to do it or not and then set deadlines etc so everybody pretty much knows what the other person is also doing so that you know uh, we also know that oh so this is the kind of idea maybe that gets picked up or mm. i need to work on my pitch or i need to work on my thing or and then a lot of times you know editors also come up with ideas and whatever and then we get a chance to shoot them down also sometimes you know like that's also very interesting like sometimes i think no no i don't think that's a good idea i was like okay fine <laughs> yeah i think it's that way i feel it's uh, a la- it's a place where you can you can have your own thought even yeah. politically i feel like that's been very important that that that, that we i think there have been discussions where we disagreed on things which, yeah Uh, and most of the times i feel newsrooms are not even interested in the opinions of their reporters um and i've heard that from other reporters because of the pace the mm. and we're in that sense i guess a little different like we look at stories we do long form reports and things so i i feel all of that added together has really made me stay with news round day also one more thing uh, i would like to tell the uh, watchers as well and chat that um, the thing with news laundry is because we are a subscription driven model we don't have to care about numbers right so essentially for example um, nidhi does a story and you know it goes on our website and say uh, if you push it like super aggressively and like advertise it everywhere whatever whatever uh, it will have like say a lakh people reading it right uh, hmm. then you know that's it that's where it ends but for us what would happen is say even if 10000 people read uh, nidhi story but then 100 people like it and actually decide to pay for it you know after reading it or like support the work that nithi is doing and news round is doing and we are doing then that's a win for us right so we don't have to like really go after numbers but we do have to do put out quality work that might convince people to support our work so it's a different sort of approach as well so that pressure is also gone that are tumne ye story kiya aur isko itna hi hits aaya aur whatever whatever that doesn't happen i mean that just simply doesn't happen so Uh, that's also a great thing about news laundry i guess yeah absolutely um okay uh, a few more question is this live or recorded it's live uh, sachin i am reading this and responding it to you like i think there's some 10 second delay but okay um interns aren't expected to have professional experience was that a question i don't know um so arshi as hey i'm planning to do my masters in journalism you all with ex- with the experience in the field how should i go about starting work i still doubt if i'm cut for this job or not do you want to give some career advice maybe mm. <laughs> i don't think you can ever uh, really know if you're cut out for the job or not until you try it and also i think there's multiple kinds of journalism you can be part of broadcast journalism which is more fast paced if you like being on tv if that's your thing so i it really depends on uh what is it that you're looking for and i think a lot of like something i have realized over time is you have to really think about the lifestyle that you want to maintain mm. right if you say you want to uh live a lifestyle and you're okay with living a lifestyle that's completely uncertain and you okay to like wake up and go at any time which is which is part of every journalist's life but i think broadcast journalism that way has a little more like immediacy Hmm. Uh, because you're you have to get to the spot right but broadcast reporting if you're doing politics and crime and all of that um and then if you're a feature writer it's different it depends on what aspect of the human story you're uh, really looking to engage with um but uh, do you think masters in journalism uh, do you have any opinion on that no no i don't think master i mean personally i don't think masters in journalism as such uh, i don't think so because really you learn on the job hmm. uh for me my masters was i think masters is a great time to zoom out hmm. uh, right if you are interested in a certain topic like for me human rights and understanding international law was something i had lacked in and things so it was a great time to zoom out and really think about what was happening in india what do i feel about it so that it gave me an opportunity but uh, and of course like if you can study abroad the resources are really good the experience the exposure is very good you suddenly realize that you know there's so much scope for different kinds of work so that way but is it necessary for journalism no 
uh, I don't think so. Not not at least in India. I think you can do perfectly fine. Uh, also, like it's not like if you do your masters, you land a extremely well paying job. Yeah, so, like you came back to news law. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think news law is great. So I am not set to be back at all. No, I have I have terrible opinions about education, so I will rather really? not give them. Yeah, I think it's a little overrated. So, uh, like, just and the education system in general is overrated. So, yeah. especially higher education. Uh, but that's me. I mean, I I did commerce, and then I just did random things. So I just feel like I learned more on the job rather than yeah. You know, class I think class. masters, if you do it like after two three years of working, it's a nice experience mm. to. as a as a person to re rethink and ground yourself that 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 is a nice place for yeah uh, also uh, arshi don't take my advice take her advice better advice <laughs> so uh, there there is meghnath uh, comes life tanmay bhat's career over i don't even know what half these comments <laughs> comments mean Uh, great work, Nidhi. I messaged you on Twitter, admiring your work, but you happen to be busy to check my messages. How dare you? Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> I will check messages. Uh, did, do you know about uh, raid night group from right wing extremist? Okay, something raid is happening. So rand. So random. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the randomness. <laughs> Are you guys planning to come to eastern parts of India and showing the true journalism to people? We do have uh, Ayan in uh, Assam, and he does do reports for us. So, for instance, also, he covered. Also, Supriti did a few reports. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. I was just coming to that. So, Supriti, uh, my colleague, our colleague, uh, she went to Assam and did like I think a four-part series. Yeah. on the brahmaputra river and how it has changed over time and the erosion and the environmental problems and how people live on the banks so that's a very good series i highly recommend I, yeah. you go and read it on news laundry uh, it was an nl sena project as well so readers funded it so that she could go and do this so please do go ahead and read that um also wonderful pictures she had taken like yeah, yeah. stunning stunning pictures um uh, mm-hmm. Eastern India. Oh, and I was saying, uh, Ayan uh, is a freelancer now who used to work with this already. He had covered Assam elections first, but I think uh, there is there it is in the plans to also like cover the eastern parts of India more. Um, and plus, with because of the West Bengal trip, we were able to make a lot of connections with freelancers in West Bengal. So you'll see a lot more stories coming from West Bengal as well. Um, and yeah, and hopefully more parts in India. We are. hoping to grow more so subscribe uh then uh, there is uh how do we get internship in news laundry and what is the eligibility uh you just send your cv on contact at newslaundry.com with a cover letter and why you want to work with news laundry and if we like it then we will get in touch uh uh the, so the link has just been shared on chat so go and subscribe to news laundry uh thank you social media team uh, do you feel frustrated or somewhere you could or should have done something but didn't and couldn't while reporting something yeah a lot of the times uh let me think of anecdotes um in the hatris case i'll go back to the hatris case i think that there were so we've also been speaking to the defense lawyer right the man who's defending the four men who were accused in the district court um and i think parikshit and i we had this experience where we were sitting with him in his chambers in hatras and uh, he he said you know he was okay with us talking about his ideas but constantly would keep going back and forth about you know whether he was okay being quoted or not so there was there was this whole scene where you know he was he had his granddaughter who he pulled onto his lap and then he started talking about how the uh, how asha the victim she uh, had not really been raped because she, did, she he said you know look at the girl in the nirbhaya case like her intestines were out uh, that's rape you know like that's how uh, that is how a rape happens and her body was completely battered um and this girl was uh, her body seemed fine 
uh so you know these moments and then later he changed he had said a lot more things and later he changed his mind about the fact that he didn't want to be quoted so it a lot of times like now also we've been working on a profile the tejasvi surya profile which will be out next week and it will be behind the paywalls so you'll have to subscribe to read it where we've sort of looked at who is this man right who is tejasvi surya what does he really believe in and i've spoken to a lot of people who've then come back and change their minds about what they said and what they wanted to say and what they, so that's for me as a reporter that's very frustrating um and it's multiple things right sometimes pe- for people it's their job like there have been people i've spoken to who are like you know who speak to me and then they're like i can't be quoted on this so that's very frustrating but um, then there are also incidents outside of this where uh, like i remember in uh, in one of the cases i had reported in long back on sexual violence itself it was it was the it was a case of a very small girl who had been gang raped and then i was in touch with her brother mm-hmm. uh, and he you know would not stop calling me or uh, being a bit weird with me so it then it was a dilemma where like you know i am i i believe i want to report on your sister yeah. what happened but i am also feeling creeped out like so do i want to continue talking to you but so, so this constant back and forth about a lot of different things that i think um, you keep going through and in every report you end up making a choice about what you leave out and what you keep that's and, true and and that's just which is why i think it's interesting to have conversations with subscribers or readers because you have that opportunity to tell them that hey uh, i had to make a choice Mm-hmm. and i had to put these things in but the story is a lot more deeper and we also have our newsletters where we have the opportunity to talk about the back story right yeah. Um, yeah. and all that said also the fact that my identity affects the report right yeah. i am yeah. going in as a woman as an upper caste hindu woman so the story that i get told and the story that a different person might get told will be completely different and this i saw in kashmir a lot like I know that my colleague and I we went to do a say, went to do the same story for different publications. Uh, he was a young Kashmiri Muslim man, and I was a a, a, a young Hindu uh, woman from South India. And um, and we spoke to the same people and had different stories. Mm. Uh, so I think all of that like plays a role, right? So so then to decide, so then it's scary when you think that the reader is thinking that this is the truth and this is yeah. what happened. Yeah. I have this urge to tell readers that hey this is what I was told and mm-hmm. this is also the truth but there are other dynamics and other things that are also playing out um absolutely and you know it's very interesting yeah. when you point out um so when I was doing the bark story as well mm-hmm. I got so many people telling me things but everyone was like off the record yeah like not no no names but we will tell you things but you got yeah. and it was yeah. so frustrating that you know, what the hell you know like itna baat kiya ghanton ke liye baat kiya and then i can't do yeah. anything at all it's but like, it also gives you there are some breakthrough moments hmm. like in, with the hatris case like i remember when akansha and i were there and the first time we met her family i think for both me and akansha it was a very uh, intense moment where we walked with her mother to the crime scene and the mother yeah, was yeah. going there for the first time after the incident um and there was there were no men right it was just me akansha her mother and her bua and we all stood there and i just asked her you know can you describe what you saw and the detail that she went into in that moment like i don't think akansha and i or or i will ever forget that moment but that moment was offered to us also because we were women and there was a sense of understanding because i know when we asked her mother in front of the other family members she just kept saying unke sath bahut bura hua tha uh so it it works both ways i think this happened with the us as well like in bengal uh, hmm. manisha whenever she would go and approach people they were yeah. more likely to talk as well because yeah uh, i mean also women were more likely to talk to her and reveal things that she wouldn't yeah. otherwise to me or parikshit uh, that also exactly. really matters and i think with the stories involving gender this is also very important right yeah and that's what uh, i think but it gets difficult with men like yeah. sometimes to access men for me as a woman especially if i'm going to rural areas right there's a whole story uh, like if you talk to men like when i'm talking to even asha's father and hatris kids they're always telling me about court proceedings logistics mm-hmm. 
uh, I'm sad very briefly. But what really goes through uh, a man whose daughter has undergone sexual violence? Right? Is there a yeah. sense of shame? Is there a sense of inability that he felt less of a man uh, with not being? And it it comes through in different ways. Uh, but I think it's been challenging for me, and sometimes I wonder if I was a man, uh, would it have been easier for me to have that conversation with him? Or in Kashmir, when I was talking to men who'd been through sexual violence, hmm. right? Like they open up differently. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have another three minutes left, so we will uh, let's talk a little bit about. the upcoming story because i'm mm-hmm. i'm very excited to hear about it a little bit so you teased it you just mentioned it by the way but i think you we should make a big deal out of it because it is going to be a big deal so guys uh, next week uh, there is a story coming up exclusively on news laundry which nidhi has done and it is a very detailed profile of tejasvi surya right mm-hmm. that's what it is yeah <laughs> i think and, as a reporter it's been one of the toughest stories for me to work on why uh, I I mean I also ask myself this because I've been in like honest like tough situations but this was tough because of the access it was mm-hmm. so hard to get uh so he refused to speak to us right he said very clearly he's not talking to the media uh now then how do you speak about a man without speaking to him yeah, and yeah. without really knowing him and yet you have to find out who he is and what and we are a profile is not just about you know these are the events of his life you're talking about like what made him who he is and what brought him to the point where he's standing in that war room and reading out the names of those 17 muslim men what led to that moment is the question we're asking essentially and uh, so like it was very tough for me to because you're also constantly thinking you don't want this to come across as slander mm-hmm. you're not just like putting in a bunch of opinions and saying and i'm also fighting my own bias uh, so i'm constantly like i am angry with this thing that he did but am i now forcefully constructing a certain kind of story so those kind of questions you know battling with that was was a task and then when you can't speak to the person because yeah a lot of times you build credibility by being able to you anyway have an opinion we're not claiming to have objective reporting we're we're doing a report because we believe something has happened and this is right or wrong and but you have you give the other person the opportunity to tell their version and here he's denied doing that right so right so to build that and then to find somebody who will be able to give us an opinion of why he did what he did and to still write that down was i think it's it's been frustrating for me to work on the report that way and also because a lot of people spoke had some very interesting things to say then would go back and be like i can't i can't have this on record it will cost me my job it will cost me my relationship so that's just been frustrating but yeah overall now i feel like the report uh, i believe now in the report and i believe that we have uh, tried to understand from his school days so we've gone back to who what kind of a student he was what kind of relationship he had with his teachers what made him who he is today and so i think um, it's not a political statement it's it's really to understand mm-hmm. uh, why because we reported so much on the bed scam i think it's important to also look at and it's for me it was also interesting because he's also my age right like he didn't yeah, grow up yeah. with a different life experience like we are similar age he's probably 30 now and we have three four years difference so we and from south bangalore so we've had that experience of being a bangalorean and you know what it means to grow up in that city so that way i uh, i could relate in certain moments i was annoyed in certain moments but overall i think i think and i hope the report is worth a good read i have read it too many times now <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's uh, releasing guys next week uh, yeah. it's going to be behind a paywall because this is the kind of uh, these are the kind of stories we have decided to put behind a paywall um nidhi has really worked hard on it uh, so please uh, do consider reading that and subscribing to news laundry when it does come up um he but also if i can just add i would just re- like this is a story i would like feedback on yeah right because this is a story that i would really like people to read and write in to me write in and tell me what worked and what didn't because i'm doing a profile for the first time 
yeah. uh, in such a manner and in, in, in this in-depth manner. So I think uh, a good feedback would be really, really helpful for me as well. So please guys, uh, read the story and give her feedback. Where can they write to you, Nidhi? Uh, well, you, you can write to me on nidhi at newslaundry.com. So yes. it's N-I-D-H-I at newslaundry.com. Or also, I think we can write to contact at newslaundry.com where we do get in our email. Yeah. But you can personally write to her on nidhi at newslaundry.com. Yeah. Uh, please uh, feel free to give her feedback on her work, her stories, what you think about it. And also, uh, thank you, Nidhi, for spending time with us. Uh, and thank, thank you, you for doing this. Uh, and thank you guys for attending and asking all your questions. Uh, we will do more of these. We are trying to do once a week, uh, you know, interactions like these with Nidhi and we'll bring Akansha and Basant and Ayush. Ayush and Basant will also come because they just did like three major stories from uh, Ayodhya. So we want to give you a chance to interact with them as well. So we will bring in more and more people. So please uh, keep a watch on that and subscribe to News Laundry, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video as well. So thank you guys. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you. Thank you, Megha. Great Saturday. Yeah, I, I was quite nervous, but I think it was okay. <laughs> it's fine. You did well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so uh, producers, we can end this. Hi, producers. Are you there? Yes. <laughs> I just said we'll end this and we'll <laughs> expect it to end. Okay. I guess Has it's it done. stopped? <laughs> no.